Why don't you grab a hand? Let's pray. It's come to that. Holy Spirit, we pray for the message and the messenger. <laughs> yes, Lord. Hey, come on, you're going to pray for me. Lord, say this, Lord. Lord. Do not humble him right now. <laughs> okay, good. Lord, I pray that you would open their eyes and their ears and their hearts. In Jesus' name. Um, I want to talk this morning about developing houses of Acts. You know, like the book of Acts? Houses of Acts. Have, how many of you have seen the movie, the animated movie, The Incredibles? How many of you have seen that movie? I have not. <laughs> I've not seen that movie, but for the last six months, I've been carrying this word about developing houses of Acts all over our city. And uh, probably about, I think it was two or three nights ago, I was laying in bed and I was just kind of doing what, what preachers do. I was kind of forming the message in my mind and thinking about illustrations to, you know, to kind of give birth to what I'm going to say. And I was thinking about this movie, The Incredibles, which my grandkids have seen and, and told us about. And, and, I, and I, so I, I Googled The Incredibles, which I love Wikipedia. So accurate. <laughs> And it said this, I love this, it says, The Incredibles is a 2004 American computer animated superhero film written and released by Walt Disney Pictures. The film follows a family of superheroes who are forced to hide their powers and live, in a, quiet, live a quiet suburban life. Mr. Incredible's des uh, desire to help people draws the entire family into a battle with Syndrome. That's Syndrome, his name was Syndrome, did you know that? Okay, I didn't know that was awesome. Who plots to wipe out all the superheroes with the killer robot. I'm like, whoever wrote this knows the Bible, right? <laughs> this is the kingdom. Like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13, verse 33, that the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, and it's needed, it's hidden into society, and it causes the whole bread, the whole loaf to rise. And I was just thinking about how the Lord, you know, the very first message that, I, that I've I found my notes, by the way, from almost 40 years ago. From, I took notes for years and years on notepads, and about probably three or four months ago, I was cleaning out uh, some of our cupboards, and I found all my notes from the early years of Bill's preaching. I'm going to sell them on eBay. <laughs> but they're in tongues. <laughs> <laughs> I love what Smith Wigglesworth said. You know, his friend, he wrote his friend a letter, and his friend wrote back and said, Smith, you spelled one word seven different ways. He said, it's a small mind that man that can only think of one way to spell something. And that's how I spell. Spell by phonics, but I don't know phonics. But anyway, but I remember Bill's very first message, or at least is the first message I took notes on, which I believe was the first message, and he talked about the kingdom of God. And people ask me this question, I'm sure they ask most of the staff this question, like, how long have you been in the ministry? That how long have you been in the ministry? That's a little bit hard to answer because three years after I received Jesus, I met Bill Johnson, and Bill Johnson taught us, if you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. And Bill said, listen, some people have a list that says, first I seek the kingdom, then I do my family, then I, you know, I have this list. And he said, the Bible says just seek first the kingdom. Like there is, if there's the kingdom, there's no second. So when I'm playing with my kids, I'm doing the kingdom. <laughs> When I'm at work, I'm doing the kingdom. And what I learned is that when I received Jesus, the day I received Jesus, I was in the ministry. Like, I may suck at it, but I'm in the ministry, right? And the goal is to learn how to be a minister. But, you know, in the book of Revelation, Jesus said, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The word Nicolaitan means conqueror of the lay people. And they, the Nicolaitans, were the people who developed the theology and divided the body of Christ into two groups of people, the people who were ministers and the people who got ministered to, the lay people. How many understand? Jesus hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans because the day you received Jesus, you became a royal priest, a son and daughter. You're in the ministry. So when people say, how long have you been in the ministry? I have to say 44 years because I've known the Lord for 44 years and I'm in the ministry. And I just began to think about the fact that Jesus has a passion for the kingdom to actually flow, not in Sunday morning in church, yes, there too, but primarily out in the, in the world. And, um, and I, uh, you know, I started the school of worship, so I love worship. Okay, did you hear what I said? Yeah. So everybody say, Chris loves worship. Okay. About 10 years ago, I stopped teaching on worship for about five years. 
I didn't tell anybody about it. I was just in this internal struggle. And it was because I felt, and I, I've since come full circle. You know, everybody knows how that is. You get passionate about one thing, and that's all you can focus on. And I since have come full circle, and I understand things in a different way. But I was in this season where I, I felt like we were raising up dualistic Christians. Like we called the service the worship service, and we called when the music starts, worship. How would you like the worship? And I began to realize that we were creating expectation that God was going to move in the worship. And we would talk about his staff. Well, God really moved in the worship. Now, follow me. I've learned that that is great. But my concern was, is that I felt like what we were unintentionally doing is creating expectation that when there was music, God would move. And when there wasn't, we should have less expectation. And I began to realize, and, and my struggle in those days was that Romans 12 says, offer your body as a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual service of worship. And I began to realize that all of life when I'm with God is worship. <laughs> that I can anticipate that, that, you know, I can anticipate that God is going to move as powerfully when there's music as when there's not. <laughs> and that whether I feel it or not, how I many you know I'm led by the spirit, not by the soul. So I love my soul, but my soul's a great servant, but a terrible master. So when I get in at work and there's a sick person at work and I don't feel a thing, how many know the Holy Spirit is as resident as he was in the greatest worship, quote, service I've ever been in because I'm still in a worship service because when I, I received Jesus Christ, my body became an instrument to worship. So I can anticipate that God is gonna move just as powerfully when we're singing, you know, when we're not singing, you know, I believe in miracles. Uh, listen, I love that song, but how many know the song is not what makes miracles? <laughs> it's faith. And I can have as much faith when I'm singing as when I'm not. So I've, what I came to is like, I don't want to lower this. That's what I was doing. I, I'm, I, was, I was making a mistake of lowering this. I'm like, I don't want to lower this. I want to raise this. <laughs> In uh, Acts chapter 2, it's funny, Jason wasn't in the first service, and this was my text. Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Why don't we start there? So then those who had received the word were baptized, and that day they were added about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship. Listen to this. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Did you get that? We would say, well, they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer. No, and to fellowship and breaking of bread. Like it's all, it's, it's, par, it's just as powerful to have fellowship and break bread with people as it is to have prayer and teaching. It's the kingdom working in practical ways in the community. We wanna just elevate prayer and say, oh, God moves through prayer. And by the way, we don't want to take that down, but we want to move fellowship up there with it and say, yeah, and when I'm fellowshipping with people, when I'm breaking bread with them, I can anticipate the same thing I have in prayer. And it says this, and everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles, and all those who had believed were gathered together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions, and they were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. I love, I love verse 46. And day by day, continue, continuing with one mind in the temple, <clears throat> and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day all those who were being saved. Did you like that? Like, in the temple and house to house. What was happening house to house and in the temple? They were teaching, they were training, they were equipping, they were seeing miracles in the temple and house to house. I'm not talking about house churches, I'm talking about church in your house. I'm talking about your house being a house of miracles. I'm talking about anticipating and expecting that your house is a Holy Spirit terrorist training center. And by the way, because we're streaming this, I have, to, I have to define. I'm not talking about terrorizing people. I'm talking about terrorizing the works of darkness. That, I, that my kids grow up in a house where they've seen miracles, they've experienced miracles, they haven't just heard about them, they got their own testimony. 
<laughs> in Acts 17, there's, here's the commentary for the unbelievers on the believers. And those who turn the world upside down have come here. <laughs> and it wasn't positive. Those who turn the world upside down, they've come here. In the book of Nehemiah, they're rebuilding the walls. You know, the whole book of Nehemiah is about rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem, right? And Nehemiah's name, Nehemiah means comforter in Hebrew. So you can it, get a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. And, but so I'm reading the book of Nehemiah. I love the book of Nehemiah for several reasons. But I caught this one verse that I love. In Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 16, Nehemiah is in the verse, chapter 3, Nehemiah is talking about where he stationed specifically different families. Like the Valentins would work on this part of the wall. The Johnsons would work on this part of the wall. The Joneses would work on this part of the wall. You get the idea. So he's assigning people to the wall. And while he's assigning people to the wall, he says this, and some of the repairs were done as far as the opposite of David's tomb, as far as the artificial pool by the house of the mighty men. This one sentence, four words, five words, the house of the mighty men. And those folks there... They repaired the wall right next to the house of the mighty men. Now, I don't know if you know much about the mighty men of David, but the Bible says that one, the least mighty men was as good as a thousand warriors. There was 600 mighty men in total, but there was 33 mighty men who were famous, who were actually each one of them named in, in the book of 2 Samuel. And I imagine these 33 men living in one house. Now that's neighborhood watch. Can you imagine 33 mighty men? One, the least of them was as good as a thousand warriors living together in a house together. No, you'd feel safe in that neighborhood. And my point is this. What if your house was a house of mighty women? Mighty men. What if your house was a place where people came in sick and they left healed? They came in demonized and they left delivered. They came in their marriage broken and they left in love. I mean, what would happen if heroin addicts came in the front door and out the back door came kingdom terrorizers? Like this is my vision, that we would raise up houses of acts all over America. People would no longer go to church. They'd be the church. They just wouldn't come on Sunday and hear a message. They would hear the message on Sunday and apply it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. When we were in Weaverville, Tracy Evans lived with us quite a few years. Does anyone know who Tracy Evans is? She is the bravest person, not bravest woman, bravest person I've ever met. You know how, have you ever been with someone who doesn't care if they die? Like, there's a lot of people like, I don't care if I die. But there's very few people who actually don't care if they die. <laughs> Being with them is scary. <laughs> and Tracy worked at the hospital. She's a physician's assistant. And she worked at the hospital as a nurse in, the, in those early days. And, she, um, and one day, and she would lead people to Christ, and she would bring them to our home group, which we had a home group for 17 years at my house. Charlie Harper and I were home group leaders together with our wives, and, um, and she would she'd lead these people to Christ and bring them to our home group, and so they called our home group the Space Cadets. I remember Charlie one time was teaching on, in the book of Acts, and Paul's message on Mars Hill, and he said, and he goes, we're gonna, we're gonna read the sermon on Mars Hill, and one of our guys goes, I've been to Mars. <laughs> and the guy sitting next to him goes, oh, I've been to Jupiter. And they started talking about intergalactic planetary travel and I'm like, Charlie, get the message back. That was our home group. And Kathy would make several of the people shower before home group. Because the smell was quite bad. One of the guys named Davey, he didn't like water, so he turned the shower on and come out not clean. And Kathy would make him go back in. She'd give him a scrub brush and go, behind the ears, Davey. And so that was our home group. It was kind of fun. So one day... Tracy Evans leads this girl to the Lord, this lady to the Lord. Uh, we'll call her Jane. And uh, they, they, she had a reputation. She was called the Amazon woman in our town. 
And she was, uh, she was the spiritual daughter of Anton LaVey, the founder of Satan's Church. She had never read the Bible. She'd read the Satanist Bible. And she had, she's a very tall girl, about probably six foot tall, long brown hair with, a, with a, a blonde streak in it, looked like a motorcycle mama, very well built. And she would go to the bars and she would, uh, she would get, have a few drinks and she'd turn into an animal, eat the shot glass and beat up guys. So one day she's, yeah, just, you're like, how did you learn these things? It wasn't through a video. <laughs> and one day, um, Jane, the Amazon woman, was down at the fast gas, which was a service station, gas station, and she was slithering like a snake and, and growling like a lion. So they arrested her and put her in the rubber room at the hospital where Tracy was leavened. <laughs> so Tracy went into the rubber room and led Jane to the Lord, which was great. And then Tracy calls and she said, hey, I just led this person to the Lord. They have, they're, they're kind of different and, <laughs> and she needs a, a place to stay for a couple weeks. Six months goes by. She's with us for six months. I remember the very first night. I remember many of the nights. I still have post-traumatic stress from several of those nights. <laughs> Jason's like, he's still trying to get over it. And Jane slept on our couch, the only place we had. She would dress inappropriately, so, you know, we had to get past a lot of those things. And I remember the very first night, she's laying on the couch, and we all go to bed. Oh, by the way, she was terrified of dark, so we had to leave all the lights on, because she didn't like the dark. And so we go to bed, and we get in bed. I don't know, somewhere around midnight, I hear, they're after me! So I throw my jeans on, run out, what's going on? And she's sitting up on the couch, and she's like, the demons are after me! And she's like, there's one right there. And she described him. I go, don't tell, don't tell me, don't tell me. I rebuke that demon in Jesus' name. She, she's like, there's another one. And I rebuke that one. And there's another one. And there's one looking through the window. And he looks like, don't tell me, I'm okay. And rebuke that one. And then she go, oh, and fall asleep. She go, they're gone. Fall, I mean, instantly fall asleep. And I'd be back in my room like. And she'd do that like three, four times a night for weeks on end. I remember one time she had problems with blood. Because we have children, I, I won't get into all of that, but she, she was terrified of blood for all the reasons you can imagine. And so Shannon, my youngest daughter, cut her finger on a, on a uh, put her hand in a can and cut her finger. And, and so Jane is holding her finger and she's like, she's bleeding, she's bleeding. Kathy's all, just put her finger under water. We'll take care of it. And so I'm, I'll get a Band-Aid, and you hold her finger. So she's holding her. She's still bleeding. She's still bleeding. So from the bathroom, Kathy says, Jesus will heal her. It'll be fine. And when she says Jesus will heal her, while Jane's watching, her finger heals. And she's saying to Kathy, it was right there. I'm telling you, there was blood in the sink. We were, we were, uh, we were, we had, we were at, uh, at home group and we were all worshiping and, and Jane was there and, and my kids would, they would stay for worship and then after worship they had to go upstairs and go to bed. So they're with us with worship and they're all little and Jane, and while we're worshiping, one, you know, Jane loved little kids and so she has my daughters, one on the left and right and she's got their Barbie doll and they're kind of combing their hair. Well, the worship got so intense that the anointing started to drive the demons out of her and she grabs the Barbie doll and rips the head off during worship and throws it across the room. And Shannon goes, she broke my Barbie. This is pretty cool. We have a, a guy, uh, we call him Too Tall Tom. He was a six foot seven guy. Um, and he had a repair shop down the street. I had a long beard. He looked like down, 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 like like that. And uh, and they were from a Sabbath keeping church, but not like a just a Sabbath keeping church. They were like the law, like they would teach the law, and you know, like circumcision to eating to the Sabbath to everything. And they were ministering to Jane for a lot of years, trying to convert Jane to the Lord. So when Jane became a believer, and she's at her house, they started coming to her house. 
So Tom comes over to my house, and, and I, I know him just because he has a shop. We have a shop, and so we know each other. And he said, hey, I'd love to see Jane. And I'm like, oh, she's sleeping on the couch, but come on in. So he come, comes in. It's about maybe 8 o'clock, 7, 8 o'clock at night. She's asleep on the couch, and we're in the front room, and we begin to have a debate about the law. And while we're debating about the law, Jane sits up. She says, I've seen a scroll. Now, she is totally in a trance, like totally asleep, but talking. She's never read the Bible. She goes, I've seen a trance. And, and, and no, she says, I've seen the scroll. And I'm like, okay. And so, and, and she goes, and she begins to read it. She says, it says, Galatians 2, 2. It was because the revelation I went up and submitted to them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but I did so in private to those who have reputation, for I feared that they might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But it was because of the, because of the false brethren who secretly brought in, who were secretly brought in, who sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ, to bring us back into bondage. And she lays back down. Wait. <laughs> Ten minutes goes by, we're, we're still debating, and, and Tom's like, what is that? I said, I have no idea. She's never seen her do that before. <laughs> we're debating again about, the, uh, about the, uh, keeping the law and circumcision, and she sits up, and she says, I've seen a scroll. She says, says Galatians 5.2, behold, I, Paul, say that if you receive circumcision, Christ is of no benefit to you. <laughs> Back to sleep. Tom looks over. I said, I have no idea. Never seen her do that before. <laughs> We're debating some more. and He's talking about keeping the Sabbath day. She pops up. I've seen a scroll. <laughs> it says, Romans 14, 5. One person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each, let each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. Whoever observes the day, observes it for the Lord. He who eats, does it for the Lord. He, and he gives thanks. And he who does not eat, he does it for the Lord. And he gives thanks. But who are you to be a judge of another servant? Back to sleep. Tom goes, I think I'm leaving. <laughs> How many of you know a man with an argument has no power over a man with an experience? I remember that this, uh, we had youth group at our house too <laughs> every week. <laughs> And about, you know, anywhere from 40 to 60 kids would gather, high school kids would gather in my, my front room, and Kathy would lead worship, and, you know, we would teach them. And so, and I had 11 disciples, uh, 10 guys and one girl. And Danny Silk, who uh, actually, Bill actually prayed with Danny to lead him to Christ, but I had been with him since he was 16. We worked in a, in a tire shop together. He got saved at 22, and he... And he, became, and he came to my youth group. He's too old to be my youth group, but I was discipling, mentoring him. So he's saved one month. He comes to my youth group, and this mother had called me. She has a, uh, a mentally ill son who's blown his mind on, on uh, heroin and wants to know if he could come to my youth group. I'm like, yeah, we see, you know, because we've seen miracles. So she said, can I send my son to your youth group? I'm like, mm, we'll try it one night. So he comes to our youth group. It's really a really intense night. Worship's amazing. He's sitting there, and he's 18. He's, he's a bodybuilder, and he looks like a wolf. He literally looks like the wolf man. And he's sitting there, and he, while we're worshiping, he turns to one of the girls, and he says, I'd like to have sex with you. She's like, whoa! Get away from me. So I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm worshiping. I'm like, and then a minute later, she turns to the girl and says, I'd like to have sex. She's, get away from me. And pretty soon these girls are like, get away from me, making a big scene. I'm like, what's going on? He's trying to have sex with me. I'm like, okay. And I'll call him John. I said, John, come. So I told my 11 disciples, take him in the bedroom, and I'll show you how to get him delivered, which I was still learning myself. So I thought this would be interesting for all of us. <laughs> well, they get him to my bedroom door, and he freaks out, and he takes off running after my three kids. They run upstairs. He runs off after him. I grab him at the top of the stairs and drag him down the stairs. We are my 11 disciples, including Danny. We take him outside. He's got a demon screaming from his stomach without his mouth moving. And, and you know, and my, 10 of my disciples are like, oh, they're freaking out, you know. 
They have to go home to change their shorts. <laughs> Danny Silk, so he's out. It's, a, it's no moon night. We're, we live in the forest. It's winter. You get the picture? He's out from maybe from here to the, to the doors there, and he's got this thing screaming out of his stomach into the valley. And Danny goes, this is just like the Bible. <laughs> that was Danny's introduction to the kingdom. This is just like the Bible. He'd been reading the, about Jesus casting out demons, and now he's encountered one. And he was so excited. Let's cast this demon out. What happens if our houses were houses of acts? Not where we talk about miracles, but we're experiencing them. Well, I don't know how to do them. If you get people like that in your house, you will learn how to do them. <laughs> Trust me, either they will leave or you will leave. I remember we were doing a deliverance and the kids were there, you know, they were supposed to be upstairs. They were supposed to be in bed, which was upstairs, but they would sneak out on the loft and look out over the loft. And we were doing a deliverance on this guy and his head spun around backwards. And all of his bones began to, he be, his body began to bend in places you couldn't bend. While we're, and, and, like, and the kids were like, whoa! I'm like, you guys, go to bed! <laughs> My kids grew up knowing there was a devil. They prayed there was a God. <laughs> we are so freaked out about sending our kids into the university system. They're like, they're going to talk our kids out of the kingdom. Unless our kids have an experience. <laughs> then your atheist professor's like, there is no God. And he goes, he hasn't seen the guy's head turn around. <laughs> He hasn't seen people bend where there ain't no bones, poor guy. <laughs> His thinking is first level. He doesn't know about a higher <laughs> law of physics. <laughs> he doesn't know about the, the law of the kingdom that transcends the laws of physics and people can do things they cannot do. He hasn't seen guys who can yell without their mouth moving. And what I'm getting at is, is that if we send our kids to university who've had an experience, the professor is not going to convert them. They're going to convert the professor. You know, throughout the book of Acts, there were certain houses. Like in Acts chapter 9, there was the Tanner's house, Simon, the Tanner's house by the sea. Do you remember that house? That's the house that Peter had a vision where the... the, the uh, the sheet came down with the unclean animals in it. Remember that? And it says that Peter went into a trance. Well, if you look up that house by the sea, you'll notice that there's lots of activity around that house, and apostles stayed there when they were traveling, and miracles and wonders and signs happened at the house of the Tanner's house. There was another house, and this is my favorite house. It's the house in Acts chapter, uh, in Acts chapter 11. It's John Mark's house. Now, John Mark... Mark is the Mark that wrote the book of Mark. And when he was a young teenager, a man named Barnabas took a hold of Mark and discipled him. Now, Barnabas was Mark's cousin, or Mark was Barnabas's cousin, depending on how you look at it. And Mark would take, I'm sorry, Barnabas would take Mark with him on missionary journeys. And he went with Paul and Mark when they planted churches, but he got scared and ran off. And you probably remember that story and Barnabas and Paul got in such an argument that literally it was the very first church split where Barnabas took Mark and went one way and Paul took Silas and went the other. But a really, really cool thing, and by the way, at the end of Paul's life, four times he calls for Mark and says, send me Mark, he's good for service. So at the end of Paul's life, he realized that Barnabas was right, that Mark actually was a kingdom man. And after Barnabas takes a hold of him, it's about 20 years later, that Bar uh, Mark writes the book of Mark. But let me tell you, it wasn't just his experiences with Barnabas, it was his experiences at home because his mother and father had a house that everyone gathered in and they did miracles and wonders and signs there. As a matter of fact, Paul was one time speaking, I believe it was at John Mark's house, and he spoke all night long, all the families would gather, and he, he, his message was so long that one of the young boys fell, out of the, <laughs> fell asleep and fell out of the window, dead, you know, from upstairs. 
And then Paul's like, oh, no problem. <laughs> and he goes downstairs, and everyone gathers around, and he raises the guy from the dead. It's like, it's not just about doing. I mean, it's not just about teaching. It's about experience. You can imagine if a guy falls out of the window and dies, and, you know, you're 12 years old, and you see, you know, somebody raise someone from the dead. How many know, you know there's a God? <laughs> It was a really cool story about John Mark's house in chapter 11 is that uh, they, Peter, first of all, they, Herod kills James. Remember there was Peter, James, and John? Herod arrests James and kills him. The people love the fact that they killed James, so he arrests Peter. And Peter's in prison, and John Mark's house was a place where people would gather for prayer, and they'd also gather for instruction in miracles. So they gather there, and they're praying specifically for Peter to be released. You'll remember the story that an angel of the Lord comes into the prison and says the foundations of the prison were shaken and the shackles fall off of Peter. Peter thinks he's in a trance, which tells you how often trances happen. Peter walks out of the prison. The gate opens automatically for him. His shackles fall off. And when he gets out of the prison and looks back, he goes, oh, this is not a vision. This is really happening. He goes to John Mark's house where they specifically are praying for Peter to be released. Knocks on the door and Rhoda the servant comes to the door and she gets so excited that Peter's at the door that she forgets to let him in. She runs in the house where they're praying for Peter to be released and she's like, Peter's at the door, he's been released. And they go, oh, that's not Peter, that's his angel. Now, how many angel encounters do you have to have to believe you have more faith that an angel's at the door then Peter, who you're praying for, is at the door. And what I'm getting at is, how would you like to have a house of acts? Where angels and wonders and signs and miracles are so present in your house that you, when someone knocks at the door, you go, oh, that's not Martha, that's her angel. She comes all the time knocking on the door. Come on in, join us for dinner. I'm saying, I want to have a house of acts. I want every household to be people who move in wonders and signs and miracles. You know Joseph who interpreted Pharaoh's dream? You know how, he, how, did, how did Joseph know how to interpret dreams? You ever thought about that? Like, did he go to like Chris Vallison's basic training class? Did he have a curriculum? You know, did Ben Armstrong, like teacher, you know, Larry Randolph or some? No, no, his dad taught him. You know how his dad knew how to interpret dreams? Because his dad taught him. Do you know how his dad knew? Because his dad taught him. You know, it all started back with Abraham. <laughs> See, Abraham, his great-great-grandfather, had an encounter with God in which he would audibly hear the voice of God, that he was known to actually leave his country to a place that God would show him, and God would literally lead him by the audible voice of God, him and Sarah. And Abraham had Isaac, and you know that Isaac planted a crop when there was a famine and no rain and reaped a hundredfold. How did he know to do that? Because his father Abraham and his, and his mother Sarah had children past Sarah's menopause. He heard the stories because he grew up in a house of miracles and Isaac created a house of miracles where it wasn't just like miracles are, yeah, let's teach about them. It's like, let's plant even though it's not raining. I know God told me to do that. And it reaped a hundredfold. And he heard the audible voice of God. Isaac heard the audible voice of God and he had dreams and vision. And he gave birth to, uh, Isaac gave birth to Jacob. And Jacob had visions, dreams, and saw angels. And Jacob had and Jacob had Joseph. Where did Joseph learn to interpret dreams? His father did it. His grandfather did it. His great-grandfather did it. And his great-great-grandfather did it. It was a lineage that flowed not from the church, but it, through, through, it flowed, help me, it flowed through the family. I was getting there. I get so excited, my mouth won't keep up with my brain. I'm saying that Joseph changed Egypt because his great-great-great-grandfather encountered a God of the supernatural, incorporated into family life. They didn't go to school, learn it. they learned it at home. And he passed that on to Isaac, who, who taught his children, Joseph and Jacob and, and all the, the family lineage. Why did, how did that happen? Because they grew up 
in a house of heroes. Their houses were houses of of the Incredibles. They looked like normal people, but they had an encounter with the God who can do the impossible and does do the impossible, and they anticipated and expected it. Why did Jacob, why did Isaac plant when there was no rain? Because he wasn't determined. His, his life was not determined by the laws of physics, but by the laws of the kingdom. Where did he learn that? From his great-grandfather and from his father. From, you get the idea. What would happen if we stopped worrying about what the world's going to do our kids? And we started teaching our children how to move in wonders and signs and miracles. And we raised up a whole lineage, a whole legacy of people who know the God of the impossible. And the commentary on your children is, those who've turned the world upside down have moved in next door. I don't want my grandchildren to hear about miracles. I want them to have their own testimony. Sometimes we isolate our kids from problems. You know, they have no test, and that's why they have no money. I took two... (laughs) Of my grandkids to, to Heidi Baker's, and we went out in the bush bush. And Heidi was casting demons out and healing the deaf. And my granddaughters were like, this is what our papa taught us about. They weren't shocked it happened because they've heard the stories, but now they have their story. We can't protect our kids. Well, what happens if the demons get them? Well, they'll learn how to get free. We're so concerned about post-traumatic stress, we don't give them anything dramatic. (laughs) Kids are bored to death. (laughs) Nothing to live for. You know what I'm saying? We gotta expose our kids to problems so they know there's a God of miracles. If you train up a child in the way they should go, then when they're old, they won't depart from it. I propose this is the way they ought to go. They ought to grow up saying, I'm in the ministry. I met Jesus when I was four, and I've been in the ministry ever since. And my mama, she taught me how to heal the sick. And my daddy, he taught me how to cast out demons. And my great-grandmother, she taught me how to interpret dreams and visions. And by the way, I have three angels that stay with me all the time. I know I'm protected. And I mean, they just grow up with an awareness that the God who transcends the laws of physics, he hangs out with me. This is what we need. We isolate our kids. And by the way, I love Christian schools. Everybody hear that? Okay. But I don't want my, ki- my kids in the Christian schools so the bad people don't hurt them. I want to put them in a Christian school so they can learn how to deal with demons and how to interact with God, then release them to a world that's unexpected. I don't want to isolate. I don't want to put my kids in a little bubble like, here, do this for 18 years, then figure out how to do real life. I want my kids to learn that it's the apostles' teaching and prayer, but it's also fellowship and breaking bread, that God meets me in the everyday life of having a conversation with people and eating dinner with people. God doesn't just need prayer and teaching. God interacts with all of my life, whether I I work as a mechanic or whether I'm a doctor or a nurse or a mom or a dad. Wherever I go, I bring the kingdom. And not the kingdom. The kingdom. (laughs) The king you felt when you said, I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. That feeling you had may be gone, but the feeler's still there. I want to pray for y'all. Would you stand up? This is my 2018 New Year's resolution. There's 9,000 people in this church, probably 4,000 homes, and I, my vision is that we'd have 4,000 houses back. that we'd meet in the temple and house to house. 
Paul, do you know what the commentary Jesus that, that was on the house meetings? It says this, Jason quoted this morning, and there was no need among them. There was no need among them. How many of you know they didn't just do signs and wonders, they did love, care, and honor, and everything else? I'm going to pray for you. Lord, I just pray that you would release angels into our homes so that the Janes of the world could be delivered. Lord, that you would teach our children how to move in the Spirit. And like Samuel, who knew the voice of God before he knew the person of God, that our children would learn how to hear the voice of God and that they would be a voice to this generation. God, that you would turn our universities upside down. That you would turn our cities inside out. That you would turn our government right side up. God, that this would be the year of the house of Acts. I pray for that in the name of Jesus. And Lord, give us strategic, strategic alliances with heavenly allies. We need angel help. God, we need it in every country all around the world. God, I pray that you would be the X factor in this generation. That what the, what the media cannot understand, what scientists cannot explain, what philosophers never believed would happen day in and day out from the houses of miracles.